we look at peace not simply from the lens of the absence of violence, but take a much more holistic approach that's rooted in questions of social cohesion, questions of the ability of communities to participate in the futures they want, and not just dream of, but actualize. And I think that's an important message to remind ourselves where we see so much zero casualty approaches to war being undertaken and peace being equated to the silent solely the ending of violence overtly. That's not what we believe peace is about. Welcome everyone to this new episode of The Next Page, our podcast to advance the conversation on multilateralism here from Library and Archives UN Geneva. Today in the studio with me is Itonde Kakoma. He's the new president, relatively new president of Interpeace, an organization that was born from a process together with the UN that has gone now 30 years doing incredible things in the world of peace and security, connecting people and connecting all of us to the dream of building peace. So it's a great joy also for me personally to welcome you here in our studio, Itonda Kakoma. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for the welcome. It's an honor to be here with you in so many ways. Thank you so much. So why don't we begin from you? So why don't you introduce yourself in your own words to our audience? Goodness, what a privilege. And a privilege to be here in this historic space in conversation with you. So my name is Iton de Kikoma. I started approximately four months ago, less, as the new president and CEO at Interpeace, which is an international organization for peace building. And I stress and underscore that description because it points to the ways in which we relate to one another as an independent organization and the UN system. I suppose we'll come to that. In introducing myself, I would add that my background, while the past two and a half years has been immersed in the world of humanitarian diplomacy as a permanent representative of the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies to the African Union. Prior to that, my background has been rooted in and nurtured by the world of peace mediation, advancing dialogue as an alternative to violent conflict. So I find myself returning back, in a sense, to my roots, but further grounded in a deep spirit of humanity as exhibited by our colleagues in the humanitarian world and enshrined in the fundamental principles of the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement, uh, as have been articulated and very much continue to breathe from, if you will, the spirit of Geneva. So there's considerable continuity between the privilege I have today to serve as president and CEO of Interpeace and what that means for my own background. Perfect. And Interpeace, for those few who wouldn't know, is based here in Geneva. I was born in Geneva, he grew in Geneva. So let's, um, yeah, let's dive in. So let's start with, with Interpeace, what it does, who it helps, and where. Thank you for this. I mean, I think our story of origin is important, particularly at this moment in which we find ourselves globally. 2024 marks our 30th anniversary. There's no surprise as to why such an organization devoted to advancing peace would emerge 30 years ago. If we take stock of events most horrifically standing out, the situation in the Great Lakes and the way in which egregious crimes against humanity were being perpetrated, amounting to genocide, and specifically genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, with ripple effect across the region and for that much part, globally, in terms of developing certain doctrine around when and how the international community has a responsibility to protect. We come out of that period, and we come out of that period in a very particular way, where various practitioners, thinkers, dare I even say luminaries in the international response space, were asking themselves and us, how do we, quote-unquote, improve international assistance in, as they put it, war-torn societies? That's the spirit we come out of. That's the vision to literally improve 
response because of the catastrophes facing the world, not only in the context of the Great Lakes, but also in the Balkans, in the Horn of Africa, in parts of Southeast Asia, where the world was grappling then, as it continues to today, on what looks like more effective, more resonant means to grapple with, again, societies that are living through cyclical forms of widespread armed conflict. And hence, and I emphasize societies, because we root ourselves in a fundamental belief around ownership. Not solely ownership at a national level, we need states. We believe in states and systems that are governed by them. But ultimately, we know that the strength of any national system is tied to its rootedness in the very citizens and communities that ultimately have to endure various shocks. We're talking about conflict, but today we can't say that without keeping in mind other types of shocks, which existed, of course, in the past and continue to do, but are amplified in the way in which they are interrelated from the shocks of climate, the shocks of public health emergencies tied and linked to climate as well, and the shocks furthered by conflict in the form of food, insecurity. And rooting ourselves in communities means that we are looking at those types of challenges from the perspective of not only ownership, but ownership towards resilience in a longer-term sense of what building peace means. And that's coming directly out of trying to better understand how we improve international assistance in war-torn societies. I don't know if we'd use that terminology today, but I think it is so plain in its description that it actually becomes more relevant for the state of the world we're in. Would you permit me one other description? That founding 30 years ago of the organization I'm privileged to lead was not only rooted in communities tied to systems, that is, national infrastructures for peace, building them up with the the notion and analysis that there will be inevitable shocks, but further situated officially in multilateralism. So as an organization, we pride ourselves still today that we come out of the UN system. We were, in fact, a part of it, as you know, but made a deliberate choice in our own now three-decade journey that in order to fulfill our primary purpose, improving international assistance in war-torn societies, our independence was crucial. But our independence, not in the absence of accountability, complementarity, and working alongside formal structures. But our independence enables us to do that much better, especially at a moment where we see those formal structures, be it at an international level or at a state level, struggling to keep up with the demands of peace and security. And in fact, you, you mentioned it. Um, there is genetic link between Interpeace and the UN. It was a UN project called the War Torn Societies Project. And then it evolved to um, a middle stage of sort of a hybrid and then evolved into a full independent and now a recognized international organization. My question to you is, in this world of peace building, peace making, Peacekeeping, they're all different things. I'm not sure our audience is expert in that definition, but we all know that there is something that makes your organization special. And so I would like to disclose that to the audience. What makes Interpeace special? I love this question for so many reasons. It's almost sentimental in the fullest sense of what sentimental means because it gets back to core. And here... I would say that our particularity, and we have to be humble in this space, we really have to be humble, but our particularity, I believe, is where and how we championed a localization agenda 30 years ago, not insisting on external intervention, waving flags, but again, rooted in, owned by, literally, advanced by the very communities impacted by seismic shifts taking place across the world. And I think that set us apart. A former boss and friend of mine said, well and good about a century-old institution, but you cannot rest upon your laurels. So if that's what set us apart, 
and arguably, I hope and can confidently say we contributed, contributed to advancing the localization agenda globally in the peace building space. What does that look like today when it is taken as a given, not necessarily a standard practice, but taken as a given that that is best practice? And that's part of what we need to grapple with in our 30-year journey. If part of our story is building up robust local mechanisms that national systems can take forward and can further enhance international efforts, okay, 30 years later, now what? Is that still the same message? When we see an increased closure of civic and political spaces where we're working, is that the same model? I believe so. But it requires a very self-critical, in-conversation, and adapting way to rapidly changing global, national, and local contexts. I think the other aspect, which I'm still learning, and I have to commend, I hope this is appropriate, the newly inaugurated president of Guatemala, who was a part of our story, a part of our journey, in leading our policy thinking, where we put forward in very bold terms this view of a participatory process, what I would call in my own experience almost a form of a national dialogue, right? If we look at certain environments where we've been privileged to accompany journeys, Mali, I say that with great respect and deference to my Malayan colleagues and their fellow citizens, whereby we were privileged to accompany a nationwide quote-unquote autobiography, I think we called it. Thousands of individuals, literally thousands, I don't exaggerate. And I had to question my colleagues, do you mean thousands? Yes. That's a very, I'll use your term, special contribution to a field that is increasingly more comfortable, also because of the way in which funding mechanisms work and the shortness of our bandwidth and attention span to deal with various conflicts and crises. But the specialness, the uniqueness of our contribution is the patience, the wherewithal to know that it takes time. And they're devoting a couple of years to facilitate a nationwide conversation. Today, we would talk about a national dialogue. When we were founded, and still, to a certain extent today, we talk about a participatory approach to building an eventual peace-building infrastructure and presence that we may, not necessarily, may be privileged to accompany in various parts of the world. I think that sets us apart. You asked a critical question, which I don't want to sidestep. The distinctions between peacemaking, peace building, peacekeeping, conflict resolution, peace mediation, etc., at a certain point, for me, become semantics. Our first chair, former President Atazari of Finland, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, who I was privileged to work with prior to my time at Interpeace, when I was at his founding institution in Finland, CMI. But in his Nobel Peace Prize address, he speaks, he draws no distinction between peace mediation and being a grand mediator on global scale to that of peace building. And in fact, at one point, he refers to his fellow peace builders, which we carry, which our sister institutions carry. And I think that's a very healthy check on an increasingly sectoralized, I don't know if that's an English term, approach to understanding what makes for peace. So I'm comfortable with our description as an international peace-building organization, but not in so far as it strangles us, silos us from this broader world that is all intending to lead to the same purpose, more peaceable societies. The means by which we get there may vary, but I really hope as we approach, say, the summit of the future, and there are conversations around what peacemaking entails, we get beyond these semantical differences, because in doing so, we're harming what makes for more sustained peace. And we'll talk in a minute about what makes peace peace last, when we move the attention from interpeace as an organization, as a phenomenon, to peace itself. But let's stay for a while, a little bit longer, on interpeace as a phenomenon of the last 30 years. You said it before, uh, I know it by experience, I was working the same building of the first war-torn societies project. I remember the very initiator of that project uh, 30 years ago. 
But I would be interested in knowing, in the way you crafted your principles as an organization, how Interpeace approach is developed to be different from the UN, because that much I know. The approach is different, and I would like to open this for our audience to understand. So I have two typologies here before me, which I do deliberately. I've been privileged in the last few years to work with your colleagues at DPPA and specifically the mediation unit together with sister institutions in this space around seminars on inclusive mediation strategies, advancing the women, peace and security agenda in practice with lead international envoys and mediators. And that work being led by CMI and colleagues in Oslo, PRIO in particular, together with DPPA. Why do I refer to this? In the context of that high-level seminar, there's a considerable reference to the UN guidance for effective mediation. And for our listeners, I think it's important because, yes, we are unique, and I pride myself in joining that. But we're not unique in the absence of similarity and in the absence of upholding broader common values and norms that have evolved with the field, which I contend we've contributed to. So if we look at the UN guidance for effective mediation... I'll just highlight a few. Preparedness, consent, impartiality, inclusivity, national ownership, international law and normative frameworks, coherence, coordination and complementarity, and then quality of peace. It adds agreements. I end with peace. Quality of peace. By contrast, we look at our principles as interpeace. We speak of local ownership. We speak of building trust We speak of reaching out to all groups. We speak of long-term commitment, that patience. And we speak of process mattering. These align so beautifully. And what they're doing is saying, colleagues, friends, to quote President Atazari, fellow peace builders, we've learned some lessons here that make for better peace. From our standpoint, we emphasize five of them, notwithstanding Many others that we should take into account. But when we speak of local ownership, we believe, and not exclusively by any means, but ownership rests, or rather longevity, sustainability of peace. And I think here I must really emphasize, especially at this moment of the world in which we are in, where the calls for war, where the use of violence is sounding much louder echoing in various chamber halls of multilateralism and decision-making than compelling cases for peace. So we look at peace not simply from the lens of the absence of violence, but take a much more holistic approach that's rooted in questions of social cohesion, questions of the ability of communities to participate in the futures they want, and not just dream of, but actualize. And I think that's an important message to remind ourselves where we see so much zero casualty approaches to war being undertaken and peace being equated to the silent solely the ending of violence overtly. That's not what we believe peace is about. And if we stop there, we know it's going to happen again. So when we talk about local ownership, it's because we have a fundamental belief that sustaining this vision of peace rests with the very communities we're aiming to accompany and support. When we speak of building trust, I can say unequivocally that the only credibility we have as an organization, the only capital we have as an organization, it's not through official mandate, we enjoy status, international organization. But I can assure you, it's solely tied to trust. If we don't have it, we can pack up our bags yesterday. And so we see building trust as fundamental, again, not only towards us, but more importantly, between communities around social cohesion, between those very communities and states, and then in the broader context in which those states operate. Because like us as an organization, individuals don't function in isolation. They function in units. And states don't function in isolation. They function in regions. We use a long phrasing of reaching out to all groups, and I think here the UN does well to simply put it in terms of inclusivity. And so by reaching out to all groups, we're talking about advancing, or rather, let me put it even more plainly. In a context like Somalia, where my colleagues tell me, and I can look at the data, and so please correct me if I'm wrong, that 75% of the population of Somalia are youth. For me, as an analyst, and as a leader of an organization, it makes absolutely no sense 
that youth wouldn't be a part of a conversation where their own future is being discussed. That's what we mean by reaching out to all groups in a very substantive manner, but equally so. And here we get to 1325, UNSC Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security. Beyond the norms, it's the recognition that if half of the population is left out of a conversation, it means that the very peace we speak of is on fragile territory. In fact, it is before it even comes to life, one could argue it's dead because the way in which it comes about has excluded, be it youth, be it women, be it other groups. And I don't equate women to youth or women and youth to other groups, but I think we need to be very deliberate as we are in our principles about what inclusivity means and representation Long-term commitment in terms of principles, I believe, is still where we stand apart somehow, but requires some serious introspection. I'm struck by the idea that we've been able to accompany communities for upwards of 20, 30 years. And that's tied to a less projectized notion of, okay, we're going to make peace like this in a one-year time frame. doesn't make sense. And those governments, private foundations, philanthropists, who put forward calls for proposals that rest on a projectized approach to peace are missing a very significant point around long-term commitment. And this is where we as an institution, I think you asked about uniqueness, joining in other with other peers, I think really have to continue in a trusted, open way conversations around a more sustainable way of how we engage in these processes. Because if we take on these short-term cycles of quote-unquote peace building and peacemaking. Of course, that has consequence for the quality of peace, but it has consequence for trust. It has consequence for the credibility of the very individuals we're claiming to be investing in, in their respective communities, because they're now subject to short-term viewpoints around a projectized notion of peacemaking. And that we can't hold up. So as an organization, figuring out the way in which we also adapt to a changing donor landscape That's not investing more in peace building. It's the opposite. What does that mean for us upholding our one of our core principles around long-term commitment? And here, process. We spoke about the origins. I would love to hear more stories about being neighbors at that moment as the War Torn Societies Project. But this is uniqueness, the process question. It's not so much, and I want to be careful here. Yes, process 100% matters. I'm experiencing this right now in learning a new organization and the care with which you have to take to embark upon new ideas, to think about strategic questions and directions. And if the process isn't clearly enough, sufficiently outlined, it can derail all the best intentions. And we see that time and time again with various peace processes, the way in which we go about identifying those who participate the manner in which that participation is articulated and mandated to quote-unquote represent matters, the extent to which the very participations are involved, not just in being represented or inclusively there at the table, but a part of the design itself, as opposed to being imposed upon or coerced to join. So here process matters. So while those are our inclusive peace-building principles, if you will, For me, they are a reflection of good practice as further enshrined by the UN guidance for effective mediation. And there's a dovetailing there because there is a specificity. That guideline is targeting mediation processes. But when you read the text underneath it, we're also talking about other longer term, broader based kinds of participatory processes. So I see all this complementarity actually between these two worlds of the UN and the world in which you exist as a peace building and this inclusive peace building concept is very particular to you as an organization. So I think this is also a good point to move the focus, if you wish, from the organization to peace. This this concept, this idea, this dream. You know, we have here in our library we have an immense painting that dates back from the thirties painted by Sorensen, a Norwegian painter, that is called The Dream of Peace, you know, and it's very striking when people look at this painting. They see their own dream of peace. We all have different dreams of peace. So peace is a different thing to different people, and um, and it's the subject of this conversation, and it's the subject of, of, of your job. So I wanted to maybe take the conversation at this point onto peace and ask you, based on your long experience, not only 
because you're the president and CEO of Interpeace at this point in your life, but also based on the Interpeace strategy. You have now a current strategy, 21-25, for example, that sets out very specific strategic aims there. But both you as a professional in peace building and mediation and Interpeace, let's talk about peace. What makes peace last? You said it before, in our time, in our history as a civilization right now, the call for war sounds louder maybe the calls for peace, but peace is an aspiration that is much more embedded in who we are together with nature as humans than war, or is it? It's a hard question at this moment. And you think about the ways in which entire cities today are being destroyed. And by cities, we don't simply mean infrastructure. Cities are made up of people and nature and art and culture. And then with the destruction of cities, civic spaces, this presents both a challenge for us in terms of humanity, but an opportunity to start dreaming, as you describe. The very setting in which we're in as an alternative vision to a world caught up in war. The organization which I'm privileged to lead is an alternative vision for how the international community was responding to war and to move us towards something other than cyclical forms of violence. I get very worried, and there's no scientific basis other than my gut instinct, which I think is rooted in some form of quality analysis. It's not. But I get worried when you start looking at cycles. There are certain parts of the worlds in which we live that have these periodic episodes of widespread armed violence happening. It takes root every 30 years. And that worries me that we haven't learned those hard lessons. And it's no surprise if young boys and girls are watching the destruction of their cities and this identity, their civic life, the targeting of their communities, and particularly mothers, sisters, aunts and neighbors, with regards to the violation of their reproductive and sexual rights in the context of armed conflict. There's no surprise that those young boys and girls... 30 years later, would stand up and say, wait a second, I get we've tried to move, we've transitioned a bit, but something's been left unaddressed. And I don't know any other way to deal with this than through the way in which I witnessed as a child or through the ways in which my grandparents witnessed as a child. And that worries me about the state of the world we're in. But it's also the challenge and the opportunity for organizations such as ourselves, Interpeace, and our sisters' organizations, locally, nationally, internationally ones, to really start making a much more compelling case for what peace entails. Because it doesn't seem to be compelling fully at present. You spoke of our strategy. And I think what our 2021 to 2025 strategy points to is something akin to what this dream of Sorensen was describing, a, a resilient peace. A peace anchored in the cohesion and resilience of citizens, with diversity, inclusion of communities, and the responsiveness, the responsiveness and trustworthiness of state institutions. So we point to three aims. Rethinking peace, enhancing resilience, and embedding peace in institutions. As a former director of global strategy for a previous institution, I know that in approaching any strategy, especially in the world in which we're, or the time frame in which we're living today, you do so with great humility. So while those strategic aims point to that dream, the means by which we get there require scrutiny, which is what any institution does in a healthy manner. And especially at this moment, I mean, we have to reflect, that was produced prior to 2021. And we think of the events of the world taking shape since then not least of which in the last few months. Do they hold water? I think so. The strategic aims? Yes. They point us in the right direction, rooted in a resilient peace, anchored in cohesion and resilience of citizens. How, in light of these drastically changing seismic shifts underway, is another question altogether. And that's where the hard work of leading organization is, together with my colleagues. In conversation with our partners, we pride ourselves as an organization that is rooted in partnership, respectful partnership, transparent partnership. So journeying on a resilient peace is also about journeying with those with whom we are privileged to work and figuring how best we get there contextually. 
But there's an overarching ambition here in that five-year vision and direction, which is on a global scale around financial institutions and the responsibility that they have in making investments that are not just doing no harm, that's a low bar, but enhancing the quality of peace. And that's a bigger vision. Equally so, we're honored, and I mean that fully, to work with formally UN agencies around quote-unquote embedding peace from a lens of peace responsiveness. So when we're talking about sexual and reproductive rights as led by our distinguished colleagues at UNFPA, how do we do that in a way that enhances peace? When we're talking about laws around labor and the privilege we have to accompany colleagues at ILO in saying, actually, some of the pressing issues we face today, not exclusively, but are linked to equitable work, fairness of, of how labor is compensated, having the right skill set to adapt to the future in the plural that we're moving towards. And if we don't get that right, that has consequence for social cohesion and stability. And I would add, with the World Health Organization, like ILO, that's reminding member states of the United Nations and its specialized entities that they come into existence not solely for the purpose of health, but health because it's directly tied to the attainment of international peace and security. This inextricable linkage between public health security as a part of international peace and security is explicit in the very constitution of the World Health Organization and is again being renewed because of the state of the world we're in as anchoring the work that WHO is advancing. We're privileged to accompany that conversation in the same way that ILO is reminding member states that embedded in its constitution is a contribution to international peace and security. That's a powerful reminder of why we come into existence and it's linked to why we as an organization have said embedding peace is so crucial. But here we have the wherewithal that institutions aren't limited to the United Nations and its specialized agencies. So taking stock of not 30 years ago, the world in which we came, but the world in which we're moving towards, in which other fora are increasingly being pointed to, even if not formally mandated, to guide us forward on questions of regional and international peace and security. How that relates to our vision of a resilient peace isn't yet, to my best reading, Four months in, fully reflected in what, how this vision comes into existence, one anchored in cohesion and resilience of citizens. Moving from the strategy to how you apply the strategy on the ground in the operations that you lead as Interpeace, there are many countries in which you're active, you have a lot of stories, success stories in the history of the organization. I would be interested to ask you, what are the obstacles? your strategy, you have an approach, you spoke about inclusive peace building, you spoke about partnership, collaboration. Well, when you go down into a context and you start doing things, is there obstacles that you that are common to your operations that you know that you know almost before you go in there, these are the obstacles that are potentially going to show up on our path to building peace that lasts? I think like many Aiming to advance peace, one of the major obstacles is an increasingly closed civic and political space in various societies, including from those very societies that have been champions on a global stage of opening up civic and political space. But because of the heightened polarization, but that closure of civic and political space is a pretty serious challenge for us, and I dare say for our other colleagues, but it's also the opportunity, especially as an independent organization. Why do I say that? That closure is linked both to those champions in community, right? But at the same time, it's linked to the closure of space for formal regional and international mechanisms to find their space of resolving dispute in an amicable way. And that gives room, and I pray with responsibility, for independent organizations to help bridge gaps between the closed domestic space and arguably a shrinking international and regional space to put forward viable alternatives to conflict. So the very challenge is why I believe organizations such as ourselves or others have much more responsibility to arguably step up. And let me be very clear, there is, this is not uh, in replacement of, but rather to enhance, to nudge, 
to navigate increasingly more difficult waters for formal institutions to find space and voice. And what I'm observing, what I'm finding, is because of the very principles that undergird what we do, local ownership, building trust, reaching out to all groups, i.e. inclusivity, long-term commitment, and process design mattering, we're finding that we actually have, I wouldn't say more space, but flexibility to carry on, if not deepen our work, because states and communities are looking for trusted partners to do so. And I see that as, so the very challenge is our opportunity. I think this is the perfect moment to maybe include multilateralism in the discussion. So you were talking about the internal, the local context, but also the global context. And the global context being what it is today and being climatically influenced by the state of multilateralism today. I wanted to draw that parallel between multilateralism and peace building. Which one serves the other in which way? In a way, you do your work, but multilateralism as experience changes over time. And today, some observers say it is at its lowest. Others say that uh, it, it's not multilateralism that is being affected, but it's the way nation states practice multilateralism that is subject to scrutiny. So it depends. It depends very much to, to the angle. But one thing is sure, there is a relationship between the multilateral environment in which your operations take place and the quality of peace building that you manage to bring out there to your stakeholders and the countries in which you're active. So how do you view this as an organization? At least two things come to mind as a means of getting to the question. One, and I hope she doesn't mind, this is the second time I think in two days I've quoted in the same way. Dear colleague and dare I say friend, Comfort Arrow, president of the International Crisis Group, on a panel we did not so long ago, spoke about crisis of peacemaking globally. And there she was talking about the crisis of higher level, if you will, in the geopolitical space, peacemaking. And the era of the mediators, many of, well not many, but a few of whom have shaped who I am, be it in book form, I look forward to digging into the archives here, but also in, in practice, honored to say, learned firsthand the likes of President Carter, former President Atizari, President Kappa, mindful, I mention all men, but men who I believe reflect certain values that extend beyond their gender in terms of the qualities of leadership that make for more lasting peace. But she speaks of the crisis of peacemaking in that sphere. And then the second way in which I try to enter into your question around the interrelations between peace building and multilateralism is the citation of the Nobel Peace Prize given to the European Union, which was a surprise to many at the time, as you may recall. But underneath it, it reminded the EU and its member states, and for that matter, the world, about what such projects are about, peace. So in as much as we can see the complexity of the EU structure as it is today, bureaucracy in the purest term of it, to make things work, the project was not about just that, it was about social cohesion, regional cooperation towards sustaining peace in a region we often forget was marred for longer periods of its history by war, internecine, cross-border, inter-kingdom, etc. than not. And so that recognition of the EU project for the Nobel Peace Prize was to say you are a peace project in itself. And that gets to your question, I believe, around peace building and multilateralism. They're tied to one another. The UN system in itself is a peace project around international cooperation. And I believe, I don't know what 75 years from now will look like in terms of the future of multilateralism, but I think we could say to our forefathers and mothers that they've done well in providing us with a framework, a vision and direction, an institution that can uphold certain universal tenets that we aspire towards. I think we can say they've done well 75 years later, preventing future generations from experiencing the scourge of war. The question, though, is to what extent does that vision resonate with the next century, particularly in light of not simply bureaucratic institutions, but the advancement and maintenance of peace? I think they are inextricably linked. A few years ago, I would say I wouldn't want to envision a world 
in the absence of the United Nations, for all of its challenges, it's not because of the UN itself. It's because of what it represents and the message it sends to current and future generations about striving for cooperation against all odds and against and rather above self-centered national interest. Naive about it, all states have interests. They have the right and freedom to exercise that, of course, but not to do so at the expense of maintaining international peace and security. So whatever form that takes in the future, I'm convinced that the future of peace building is inextricably linked to the future of multilateralism. The form and shape in which that takes is now up to us. So that 75 years from now, our, we can even use a, a futuristic sentiment, our future ancestors, <laughs> our children, will look with the same sense of respect as I do today for the archives here in this building. I'm not sure we have put forward yet the quality and enduring vision of what the future of multilateralism requires in a way that's lasting 75 years from now. And that has to do with some of these very principles we're talking about. There is a clear message. It's no secret. Secretary General says it almost every other week. Secretary General of the United Nations, that is. That we really need to take more seriously the question of representation and inclusion. And if we don't, then... These great holes become vestiges of a bygone era without relevance to the pressing concerns of the world in which we're facing today and surely will face in the future. But again, this is inextricable from the future of peace building, which is linked as much as we emphasize social cohesion and resilience of citizens. That is not by any means in the absence of states and states in cooperation regionally and globally. And that's multilateralism. There are many things you've said in the last five minutes that could sound like the one thing that you want the audience to remember from this episode. But I'm going to ask you that question anyway, as we wrap up this episode. What do you want the audience to remember from your experience and your strategy as an organization, but also your dreams as president and CEO of Interpeace? Number one, we have a responsibility to put forward a compelling case for peace, especially at this moment, and a peace that is beyond the scope of the absence of violence. We have a responsibility to do so. And we have a responsibility equally, and I mean we deliberately, to put forward a vision and direction, the dream you described, that's more enduring than the short-term interests of electoral cycles and the narrow interests of individual states. We wouldn't be in these premises if that was the sole drive in creating these United Nations. Now, we're also not naive. That required strong states, but in consort. And it required leadership, but with backing, not an isolation of systems. And I don't think at this moment in time, we should be looking for some magic out of the sky, but it really requires our generation to bear the same level of responsibility as past generations in putting forward more durable frameworks that can last beyond, again, the narrow interests of a select few. And this becomes much more important as we see the gap the socioeconomic gap widening. And that's a very dangerous proposition in the face of what will surely be more calamitous times ahead in the face of a climate crisis, which will surely bring about further health crises and will most definitely bring about greater instability. Finally, and I think I would really want to emphasize this now in these chambers, the quality of peace that we envision in the future is also tied to the manner in which wars are fought, how violence is inflicted. And if we are no longer able to uphold basic fundamental norms in the conduct of hostilities, this has consequence for our ability to put forward more persuasive cases for peace. That's what I would want to convey. And in short, that's about upholding international norms, which are not just about law, it's an expression of our human values. Well, thank you so much. Itondaka Kakoma, President and CEO of Interpeace. Thank you for taking the time for being with us. Thank you.